The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. For those of you who don't read the Times back to front every day, there was a terrific section that relates to today's lecture. It's not as, uh, it didn't give me nice cases as Don's did, but the, but the headline captures a lot of what goes on in the section and a lot of what we'll talk about today. The headline is, Fuel to Burn, Now What? So I'm going to talk about shale and its implications and what it's done to the energy universe in the last last couple of years. But first, I've got some unfinished business uh, from last time, a couple of questions I didn't answer. Prosper asked whether anybody was still making coal gas uh, in the old-fashioned manufactured gas, town gas, heated and used the results style, and I couldn't find anybody. I looked around, I did the usual kind of web crawling, but what I did find is a lot of people that have made and are making gas from wood. This is a, uh, a reactor being sold by a company in South Africa that sold it to a number of locations. Wood pellets to make gas, sometimes for, for uh, vehicles, sometimes for um, um, uh, use in gas mains. Um, and this one, I, this is from Wikipedia, but I couldn't resist it. This is a North Korean wood powered truck. Uh, <laughs> But if you, if you browse around, there are a lot of examples during World War II where these reactors were put on cars that were then converted to run on wood because you couldn't get gasoline in continental Europe in World War II. So it's not a novel technology. It's not your first choice technology for vehicles. Uh, but in places that have a lot of wood and not much else, it apparently is an interesting and used technology. There are plenty of vendors. There are plenty of examples. So wood gasification, but I couldn't find anybody who's doing coal commercially. So that's answer, that's, that's unfinished item one. Uh, unfinished item two was CO2 emissions. Sidhanth asked about how fossil fuels compare, and I kind of mumbled, um, you will recall. It, it turns out, if you think about it a little bit beyond the mumble stage, it's not a simple question. You can do, emissions per BTU, right? You burn the stuff, what, what do you get um, uh, per BTU? And that's the carbon-hydrogen mix in the, in the fuel, which varies slightly. So you see coal has about 75% more uh, emissions per BTU than natural gas, and uh, petroleum-based fuels are somewhere in between. But of course, you don't buy fuels for BTUs, you buy fuels for some purpose, some energy service, you will recall. We don't actually, most of us live for BTUs alone. Uh, so he, home heating, that would be a good comparison. But suppose you want to do electricity. Well, then you have to think about how efficiently you can use them in electricity. You'll note that a, uh, a gas combined cycle plant is more efficient than a coal, uh, a traditional coal steam turbine plant. So that means in terms of per kilowatt hour, the advantage to gas over coal grows. And you'd think about gas powered automobiles versus gasoline powered automobiles. Again, there's a difference in engine efficiency. But even that, um, you got to think about the emissions in producing it if you want to do this kind of comparison. And I haven't really seen a good study that lets you get to that third level. So good question, easy answer here, somewhat easier answer, somewhat harder answer here, can't answer that. Okay, any questions or comments on either of these first two topics? Okay, let me go to shale. So the new technology that really has changed, well, it is and it isn't a new technology, so let me be a little bit clear about that. But this is horizontal drilling and hydraulic cr cracking, called fracking. So there's sort of two pieces to it. 
One is the ability to, to drill deep into shale. This, this little example shows shale 7,000 feet deep. Uh, in, in this case, the Marcellus. I think this is from the, the, the pen environment thing. And to do horizontal drilling. Horizontal drilling is not that new, but it's relatively new. And then to put down fluid, which I'll talk about in a bit, under pressure to make cracks in the, in the shale, which permits gas and or oil um, uh, to come back into the pipe. Fracking, if you just drill down and, and crack horizontally, has been done for a long time. Horizontal drilling has been done for a relatively long time. Putting the two pieces together has had a revolutionary impact. The, I caution you, the Times repeats what the President said in his State of the Union message, which is, DOE started all of this in the 80s. Well, pe this drives people in the industry crazy. They say DOE invested a few dollars in the 80s, and then a whole bunch of little U.S. companies invested a lot since then to actually make this work. So it, 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 big firms like Exxon did not have this technology. They're busy buying small firms. Does this sound like a familiar story from, from Don's discussion? I mean, little guys experimented and experimented and got it to work. So most of this fluid, and we'll come back to this, is water and sand. But there's other stuff. And what other stuff varies from producer to producer and is the source of a good deal of controversy. But it's mostly water and sand, and what this does is it makes it economical to extract gas and oil from seven, 10,000 foot underground shale deposits. Now, it, it's not just that it's possible, it's cheap. And cheap is the story. Um, now there's shale around the world. Oh, well, yeah, this is what, this is what one well look, one installation looks like. This would be called the pad. And what normally happens is you drill multiple wells from a single pad. So they might go underground this direction and this direction and whatever. So you cover an area with multiple wells from a pad. When you pump the water down under pressure, it comes back. There's a shock. And it comes back not only with the stuff you put down, but with stuff it picks up. Various underground minerals and chemicals and occasionally something's radioactive or something's toxic. It is then typically, I assume piped, although I don't see pipes, it's piped to a, to a holding pond. Uh, and from there, it's interesting, in this picture, it's being trucked away. Uh, sorry, the... The water is stored in a pit or a pond and then taken to a treatment plant. What's often done with it instead is it's injected underground in a deep well. So it either get, the water either gets treated out of, this, out of this pond or it gets either here or someplace else dumped back into something that'll hold it underground, some formation, where you might otherwise store CO2, for instance. But that, those are the two possibilities. So questions about the, the basic story here, the, the, the basic process? Yeah. It's put back into the ground after you extract the, the usual gas. Well, the gas has come up with it. So you're, you're basically taking the gas off, and, and then you, you take the water. Uh, yeah, no, this is, this is not, this is not full, of, full of commercially recoverable gas. Yeah, Jacob? Well, usually a surfactant of some sort to reduce surface tension to make it more easily penetrate. In some cases, people have put benzene and various petroleum products down. This causes a lot of distress, as you can imagine. Um, but usually, usually some surfactant and other stuff. The, for the little guys, this has been sort of a secret sauce. It's mostly, mostly water and sand, and I'm not going to tell you what the rest is. Ha ha. Well, if you have, what's missing here is, is this might be an aquifer. 
So there might be groundwater issues, and we're going to talk about this. Usually not coming up from 7,000 feet down, the aquifers are higher, but if the well's integrity is breached, stuff can come out from the well, and that happens. Okay, anything else? All right, so that's the picture. So this process now makes it economical to extract oil and, and natural gas from shale. Where's the shale? This is, the key thing is this gray bar is the height, is the amount of shale gas recoverable. Uh, the black is coal bed methane, which is, you know, also, also doable. But the new, the new thing is the gray bar. And you will notice we have a lot of it. There's not that much in the Middle East. Uh, some presumably in Africa, but little exploration. Some in Latin America. A lot of it over here in Asia Pacific, which is mostly China. So China appears to have a lot of shale. We got really lucky. We have enormous amounts of shale from which this stuff is recoverable. Australia often refers to itself as the lucky country. Uh, in this one, we got lucky. Uh, Europe, um, this I believe is OECD Europe, and that is mostly Poland, which is, which is starting to, starting to uh, work on it. So where is it in the US? Well, the good news and the bad news is a lot of it is near where demand is, as opposed to, say, wind or solar that tend to be in the desert or in the high plains. The, a big play here is the Marcellus. And that's New York and Pennsylvania and Ohio uh, and kind of in this eastern region. That's enormous. That's just an enormous amount of recoverable gas. The other play that people talk about, other plays that people talk about are the Bakken up here, mostly in North Dakota. The Bakken has a lot of oil that is being recovered using this same technique, as well as gas. There are not a lot of pipelines out of North Dakota, and as we will see, that's a problem. But oil you can move. Oil's, uh, oil's valuable enough you can find a way to move it. The, the other places are the Barnett, the Barnett Shale, a lot of which is, oh yeah, there are a lot of people up here <laughs> in the Marcellus. Some of this is rural, some of it's near urban areas. You read that Penn Environment document, they talk a lot about schools, libraries and stuff. Down here in Texas, a lot of it's not near anything which is all good, and in the, bar, in the Bakken, a lot of it's not near anything. Um, I think the Eagle Ford supposedly has a lot of oil, but people have been doing various kinds of fracking in Texas, not necessarily horizontal, but vertical and experimental, for a long time. Nobody's drilled for anything in the East since the first Pennsylvania oil field went dry in the 19th century. Um, the well, I'll, I'll say a little more. Uh, as you see, there are plays elsewhere, but, the, but in Arkansas, for instance, there's, there's some action. Um, but this is, the Marcellus is what people talk about a lot. The Bakken, there's a lot of action, and then down in Texas. Um, with a little bit elsewhere, a little, little in California. Colorado, again, people have been doing this in Colorado for a while. The reserves are smaller, and I don't know much about most of the others. Comments or reactions about this? Okay. So, what's all this done? Well, it's created a boom. This is a map of wells in Pennsylvania through the end of, of 2000, 2010. You see, the, you see the trajectory, 27 wells drilled in 2010, then 161, then 785, then 1445, and 3,000 wells in the ground producing by April of 2011 with rapid permitting going on. Concentrated in a, in a few areas. Uh, similar story elsewhere. They, the, the Pennsylvania folks just happened to have provided a convenient map. So you have a drilling boom. Um, to get at this resource. 
What's it done? Well, it's depressed gas prices. You may recall last time, this is a Henry Hub, Henry Hub uh, price. Last time th this graph cut off about here. This is the result. This is the um, uh, rest of it. We're down in the neighborhood of $2 uh, per million BTUs, where the normal price was tending to be around 10. 10, 8, 10 was what people thought was sort of normal. And again, if you go back to the Pennsylvania figure, oops, the drilling, this is all since it just began in 2007. There is no pre-2007 drilling in Pennsylvania. And there are 3,000, more than 3,000 wells, probably four by now, uh, producing. So this has come on very fast, very big, and in parts of the country where people live. And it's depressed the natural gas price. To go to a, a question that we discussed last time, this is arguably old business, but just to do a, an oil, oh yeah. People in the business say what happened, the reason we're at $2 is a lot of people got very excited. This happens in businesses like this. Everybody drills a well, all of a sudden, oh my God, we've drilled too many wells. It's not profitable, most people say, to get at this gas at $2 a million, cubic, a million BTU. But at four it is, and at six it is. So somewhere in the four to six range is where people look for a long run equilibrium. Drilling will slow down for gas alone. Demand will pull the price up, blah, blah, blah. So they look at the four to six range as opposed to the eight to 10 to higher range as a place where gas will settle down. And there is a lot of it. There's controversy about how much there is. But so one thing it did was to depress the gas price. It drove an interesting wedge between gas and oil. So this is another one of these comparisons. If you just look at dollars per BTU, which is, I, I caution, is kind of a crude measure, right? Because not all BTUs are created equal. Uh, gasoline is better for automobiles because you can have a higher energy density in a longer range and so forth, and it's easier to transport per BTU. So oil has a variety of advantages, but if you just look at BTUs, then the conversion factor is apparently 5.825, which references tend to agree on. Uh, so that means if gas is $2 a million BTUs, that translates into $11.65 a barrel of oil. But when gas hit $2 recently, over here, oil was over 100. So that says in BTU terms, the difference right now is enormous, is enormous. If you can find a way to use the gas BTUs and not oil BTUs, it makes a big difference. Um, it makes a difference in a lot of settings. I have a colleague, I haven't seen, I haven't seen the paper, but he says it's straightforward that a natural gas car dominates an electric car. Um, an all electric car, you gotta have an expensive battery, it has limited range, da 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 da, you gotta plug it in. A natural gas, you need a tank. Engine is trivial to modify, doesn't cost much more, and the range is also limited, but it's about the same. So why would you buy an electric car when you can buy a gas car? Well, we'll see if we, they're not subsidized yet. Uh, we'll see. But anyway, this is a big deal. Again, historically, there are gaps between oil and gas. They don't, they don't track precisely because, as I mentioned last time, you don't really have electric utilities substituting every five minutes between oil and gas. But this is pretty much unheard of. That difference in, B, in price per BTU is unheard of, and it's opened in the last couple of years. So that has implications. And again, the Times talks about, about this without the picture. The other thing it does is look at this. This is the uh, Energy Information Administration's uh, annual energy outlook early release, which came out uh, either January or February. It says, this is their projection for future production of natural gas. This brown thing on the top is shale. I mean, look at it. There's nothing going on here until, oh, about 2006, 2007, and then it explodes. 
And by 2035, it accounts for, what, almost half of total U.S. production. Previous, previous efforts, uh, previous work, sort of focused on these. Uh, just plain old gas, gas that you get with oil, coal bed methane, steady decline, increase in demand, lots of imports. Tight gas, which is related, is going up, but shale gas is projected to explode. I happened to look, because I was updating last year's lecture, and I had a graph like this last year. The graph last year showed, this was again, um, circa last June or July, no, it would have been March or April. Um, it showed the U.S. being a net importer of natural gas through 2035. Again, this was a year ago. It projected big increases in shale, but not enough to offset demand and said we would be an importer through 2035. The current projection a year later is we'll be a net exporter of liquefied gas by 2016. We'll be a net exporter overall, pipeline and liquefied, by 2021. That's in a year. That's unheard of, just, just to be clear. That's a dramatic, dramatic change. I think when I taught this two years ago, I'm not sure we mentioned shale. Anyway, the other thing is it has had an impact also on oil. If you look at oil, U.S. production of oil, as we discussed early in the semester, has been in long-term decline, in large part because of shale and related developments, it, they now project a pretty steady increase in U.S. production. Uh, and this is not, oh my God, we've, we've authorized deep water drilling, or oh my God, we're dribbling, drilling the uh, uh, National um, uh, Wildlife Refuge on the North Slope. This is under current policy. This is under current policy. We will produce lots more oil. Okay. What's good about this? What are the benefits? We'll come to costs in a minute. But why, it, why, is this a good thing? Why is this a good thing, Maxwell? It'll get us energy, it'll move us toward energy independence if we use the natural gas in transportation. Most, um, energy security, rather, yeah. You get, it'll affect our balance of payments regardless. It'll, but since most of our gas imports are from Canada, I know they're shaky up there, but but to the extent we use it in transportation, you really get some energy security benefits. And I, let me just expand on that a little bit because I know other people want to talk. One of the interesting things in here that I hadn't focused on, uh, in the Times rather, they talk about the garbage truck market. Garbage trucks are perfect for this. They're centrally fueled. They're in use for a few hours a day. It's, it's perfect. To, and given the price difference, the fuel price difference, they said something like half of garbage trucks sold now are natural gas compatible. A third of buses sold now are natural gas compatible. So you do expect a reasonable amount of use in transportation that'll reduce our imports, improve the trade balance, and improve energy security. Anything else? Yeah. Reduction in emissions. Reduction in emissions. We'll get I want to come back to that later because that's, that's an issue. You expect it to reduce CO2 emissions as we move from coal to natural gas. There's some controversy there, and I want to come back to that. Jessica? It's a new resource, but um, we have most of the infrastructure laid out already. So you're taking most of the cost out. Or it's easier, or the there's less of a barrier of entry to adopt this technology. You don't, have, you don't have too much of a chicken egg problem because you do have the pipeline infrastructure in place, not everywhere, and I'll, we'll see that in a second. Um, um, you do have to put in, if you're gonna do it in transportation, you have to put in um, uh, refueling stations. The Times argues that to do it effectively in trucking, forgetting about garbage trucks and so forth that you can pretty much do now, to do it for interstate trucking, you need, they said, 2,800 fueling stations on the major truck routes, and people are building them. David? Increased cost of energy, which is like economic growth. And more competitive you expect the U.S. industry to be more competitive because costs have come down. Um, there's the other interesting thing that 
We tend to forget because we think of natural gas, particularly in this class, as mostly an energy source, but it's a feedstock for a variety of chemical processes. And so a bunch of industries that use that as a feedstock, plastics importantly, but others, are moving back to the U.S. because it's so much cheaper here than elsewhere. So you're getting sort of natural gas-based manufacturing moving back, not only because energy costs are down, but because uh, feedstock costs are down. Anything else? Ryan? Jobs. I've got a great graphic on that that I'll show you in a minute, but that's normally the first thing in Congress, it's the first thing they say. This is jobs. Okay. I think we have, we have a, most of the benefits, but not all. Anything else anybody can think of? Oh, sorry. Yes, Kirsten. It might be less volatile, I think so, uh, but you still have this short run inelastic demand, inelastic supply issue, and a really cold winter or a really warm winter can have an impact. They do store gas, not just in the big tanks you see when you drive south along the waterfront, but it's stored in underground caverns and has been for a long time. So it, it, you would hope that the volatility will go down because we're a little bit out of the world market. Yeah, didn't have that. Anything else? Yeah. It might if, they, if it comes from federal lands. Suppose it comes from private lands. I have friends who inherited a, an otherwise useless ranch in Texas and were told, there's natural gas under your land. We'd like to drill. They like that. Uh, <laughs> they liked it because they weren't going to live there. In fact, nobody was living there. And uh, they're happy to uh, cash that check when it comes in every month. So it's, it's, it's money for the government in revenues, depending on the royalties. It could be money from landowners. Um, and that's everything except something that um, uh, we haven't talked about and you might not pick up until we've talked about electricity. And that is one of the issues of bringing in... Um, wind and solar is you need, they vary, and they vary unpredictably. So you need resources that can respond to that. I mean, storage would be swell. Storage is the holy grail. We don't have storage economically. So what you tend to use is you tend to use gas turbines. And gas turbines, if you recall, from not, not combined cycle, but plain old gas turbines, and on an earlier slide, I had the efficiency of those, and it's not high, but they're quick. Well, this reduces the running cost of the devices you will use to use more wind and solar, and thus makes it easier to integrate wind and solar into the system. Jacob, you had a point? Yeah, well, I was just going to say, if you're going down the path of, like, it, it provides baseload power for... It can provide baseload. It provides, as we were saying, lower emissions baseload power, particularly the combined cycle stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and you use the combined cycle stuff for, for baseload. I, you may or may not remember the brief discussion of combined cycle. We'll probably come back to it. But when we talked about Hexion, uh, I mentioned there were two, uh, uh, two sorts of technologies. Um, and the combined cycle technology is a generating technology, not unrelated to what was going on at Hexion, but it's generating technology. You use natural gas or oil or whatever, but typically natural gas, to run a gas turbine. The exhaust from the gas turbine is hot. You use the exhaust from the gas turbine to heat water to make steam, and you run a steam turbine, hence combined cycle. You can get a lot of efficiency because you're not putting out a high temperature exhaust, you're not wasting that heat, you use it. And you can use it effectively in a steam turbine. So that's effective. So the other thing we didn't talk about, and that's because you don't own homes. Uh, but if you own a home, you'll have lower heating costs. That bill that comes around in the winter will be lower. This is a good thing. I just managed to persuade my condo to convert to gas from oil. Um, and electricity will be cheaper. So for those of us who pay these bills, 
That's a good thing. Uh, we'll reduce gas and probably oil imports. Um, we'll also we'll reduce it because there's more production, but also because you'll be substituting uh, uh, gas for oil. Um, U.S. manufacturing, people get very excited about a rebirth of U.S. manufacturing, some of which is driven by energy, some of which is driven by feedstock prices. Um, easier to integrate wind and solar. Money for people in rural Texas. Uh, for ranches they have no intention of living on. Um, we're going to talk about the, I didn't underline some, but I probably should have underlined some. Um, fewer neighbors in rural Texas than, oh, say, in urban Pennsylvania. That's an issue. And of course, jobs. This is North Dakota. These are pictures of North Dakota. And this is oil production in North Dakota. North Dakota is now the number four oil producing state in the country from pretty far down the, down the league table. And for the last three years, I don't know what the early 2012 numbers are, but for the last three years, it's had the lowest unemployment rate in the country. So if you're from North Dakota, this is fabulous stuff. All of a sudden, the land is worth something. All of a sudden, there are a lot of jobs. And if you're running a restaurant, all of a sudden, there are people who come in. Um, this is oil production. This is gas production. And this is an interesting graph for a number of reasons. You see what you would expect, which is uh, natural gas production goes way up, but there aren't pipelines. And this is the percentage flared. So not marketed means flared. They're burning it. Um, so they're burning, well, depending on the, on the month, up to 40%, typically above 30% of the gas produced. The money's in the oil. They don't, have a, they don't have enough pipeline capacity to get the gas out, so they burn it, which is a shame. Somebody will build a pipeline. That's money. That's money being burned. OK. Comments? But there are issues. Um, you can find. And I was going to try to do it, but my, my earlier attempts to link YouTube videos didn't work well. But you can go to, go to YouTube, and most videos on fracking uh, look, look like this. Somebody, somebody pours water, lights a match, foomp. Uh, and earthquakes. And earthquakes. There was some recent press coverage of fracking-related earthquakes. So this is not a benign, completely benign technology. I mean, neither were railroads, neither were coal-fired power plants, neither are automobiles. But it, is, it, it has issues, some of the issues. They mostly come from these, from these features. Um, some of the fluids contain toxics. Some of the stuff that's pumped down, and again, it varies from player to player, uh, is toxic. Uh, the water that comes up has at is at least as bad as the stuff that went down, often quite, quite a bit worse. It's got whatever junk it picked up uh, under, under traveling through thousands of feet of, of rock. Um, the wells go through aquifers often. You drill down, you're drilling down through an aquifer. That's somebody's groundwater. That's the well water that's uh, burning. Um, Methane has its own toxicities. It is flammable, per that picture, uh, and it is a greenhouse gas. So the question that Philip raised of lower, lower emissions gets to be a little complicated because methane leaks. So these are the main issues. Let me just walk through some of the environmental problems. First is groundwater contamination. Not that big a deal in Texas. Big deal in Pennsylvania. They actually have water in Pennsylvania. Um, 
the best evidence I know says that the problem comes from the well bore from going down. That it's very hard for the gas to leak up from 7,000 through 7,000 feet of rock into the groundwater. But in any case, there are plenty of examples where groundwater has been contaminated. There's also this issue of wastewater, the stuff that's coming back. It's got all kinds of junk in it. Uh, if you don't inject it safely, if the holding pond leaks, if the treatment isn't adequate, you can have that as a source of contamination. There is nearby pollution. I mean, there's all this junk. You're running an industrial operation. Again, not necessarily so terrible in Texas. Do I have a picture of? No, I don't. Uh, not so terrible in some places. But the methane will be out. That's not nice stuff. Various other toxic things come out. Volatiles in the groundwater. You get dust and noise and a lot of traffic, a lot of vehicle traffic. You truck the gas out, typically, and find a pipeline. You don't build a pipeline to every well site. So it's noisy and messy and dirty. Does that matter? Well, in Pennsylvania and New York, there tend to be a lot of people around. In North Dakota and Texas, not so many. So whether these things are important or not depends on A, what the well does, and B, what damages it inflicts. Huh? I mean, my friend's ranch, there's nobody for miles. Uh, so yeah, there's dust and dirt and traffic and junk, but it's polluting the sagebrush. Uh, in that pen environment thing, there are schools, hospitals nearby. Methane leakage. Let me talk about methane leakage. There was just a piece in nature uh, about methane leakage from one field that, that folks managed to measure well. And it was like, not to make up a number, like 6% of total production leaked. Well, methane's a greenhouse gas. Uh, we talked about that earlier. It has a relatively short half-life order of magnitude 10 years, quicker than carbon dioxide to come out of the atmosphere, but while it's in the atmosphere, it's potent, more potent than carbon dioxide per unit of mass, or maybe per mole, one way or the other. In any case, this is sort of a serious issue. If you're going to produce this stuff at scale for a while and dump a lot of methane in the atmosphere, you're going to have climate implications. There was a study that said um, producing and using natural gas via fracking is worse for the climate than coal on a life cycle basis. Um, that study was pretty badly flawed uh, because it, it assumed very inefficient coal plants. But if the methane leakage is high enough, that could, that could be right. And if you use the right measure of climate damage which I think you used the wrong measure of climate damage as well. But that's a serious issue. Earthquakes. Uh, another fracking earthquake from that t-shirt, great t-shirt. Uh, again, this year, th there were discussions of earthquakes in northwest, northeastern Ohio, uh, thought to be associated with basically dumping all that water deep underground, kind of lubricating the formations. Uh, an Ohio regulatory authority, with a lot of cons consultation with geologists, has verified, they think, that in fact the fracking was the cause. Small earthquakes, but you know, small earthquakes are earthquakes. Um, magnitude three kind of earthquake, for those who follow that sort of thing. Um, in Ohio, they've responded by saying it doesn't always do this. It does it when it's injected in certain ways into certain formations. And they have a set of regulations for Ohio that uh, they think will deal with this. But it's an issue. Earthquakes, not everybody's favorite. How many people have been through an earthquake? 
Oh yeah. From California, where? All over. Yeah, there was a little one here. Yeah. Okay, that's true. That's true. That that, that doesn't count. Yeah. If it's not magnitude five, at least it doesn't count. Okay. It's a weird feeling, and in Ohio, it doesn't happen. <laughs> but it does now. It does now. Okay. And this one is actually very interesting. If I, if I, as I hope you did, you looked at the Jacoby et al. article. Their argument is. If you look down the road, we're going to need, and you're serious about climate, you will recall from our, our difficult negotiations, the world's going to need big reductions. And you can't get the big reductions unless you, get, unless you can figure out some magical way to do transportation. But you're not going to get the big reductions unless you get the, the carbon emissions from the electric power sector way down. Natural gas doesn't do that for you. It gets it down, but not way down. But if natural gas is cheap, then A, you don't build a nuclear plant. And you don't fool around with nuclear technology because it's so non-competitive. And wind and solar require bigger subsidies to compete. And so the argument is it's quite possible that cheap shale gas will slow the development of very low carbon technologies and thus be a bridge to nowhere, right? It'll e we will easily re lower the carbon content of the electric power system and heating and other things. But after a while, we won't be able to go any farther because we won't have the technologies we need because they will, will have been non-competitive all along and been very expensive in subsidy terms. And so we could, this can easily be a bridge to nowhere that stops progress on climate after a while. That's, that's why it's a complicated question. Uh, short term, yeah, unless you get a lot of leakage. But the long term question is really hard. What, what, what's it mean for wind, solar, nuclear, other carbon free technologies? The European Union, I learned on Monday, has a formal plan to have zero carbon dioxide emissions from its electric power sector by 2050. Zero. And as the presenter said, we in Europe do a lot of talking. Uh, but, you know, if you do a projection of what it takes to get 80% of reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, boy, you better be pretty low carbon. And natural gas won't get you there, no matter how cheap it is. Okay. What's the policy invite? Questions on any of this? Yeah, Max. It just well, it wind and solar are being driven by subsidies. And those subsidies get to be more expensive as the alternative gets to be cheaper. So uh, the argument is, yeah, you could. But if you were starting a wind turbine business, you'd have to be really sure of the subsidies or pretty sure that you can get the cost down so you won't need them. The lower the cost of gas is, the harder that second is to be sure of. And the lower the cost of gas is, in a way, the first gets shaky because it becomes hard politically to justify subsidizing wind and solar when we're moving into gas and emissions are going down and we're all swell. Nuclear, I think, is going to is going to hit be hit the hardest. Um, there's well, we, we 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 may talk about nuclear and we'll hear about nuclear from some of your papers. So I'm looking forward to learning. Um, but I think what what people do tend to say is with gas at these prices, even not forget $2, but $4, boy, is a nuclear plant out of the money. And if you don't build them, it's hard to really prove out the technology. And so all these fabulous designs for intrinsically safe, small scale nuclear plants, but unless we build them, we're not going to know. And building them gets to be a more expensive proposition. So it's hard to do that. Nuclear is tough because you really need to do it at scale. 
means somebody's got to bear the commercial risk, and the commercial risk gets bigger with cheap gas. So I, mean, I think that's the, basic, that's the basic issue. I mean, the government could say, look, I think this is so important, we're going to keep doing it. The Europeans might. I worry about us, and we'll see about the Europeans. We'll see about the Europeans. Anything else? Yeah. Doesn't it matter also, though, if, we'll ha if in uh, a few years we'll have some sort of like carbon tax or something like that? Or because then you would start arguing that uh, whatever emits carbon will become less competitive? Yeah. I mean, it, with a serious carbon tax, again, cheap shale, cheap gas. Um, the advantage of renewables over gas fired power goes down with the price of gas given any carbon tax. You're right, the carbon tax widens the gap, cheap gas narrows it. So you need a bigger carbon tax to have the same, di the same differential. Um, I mean, we all, we all say, of course, we're going to have a carbon tax at some point. We have to have a carbon tax at some point. Um, I know people who've been saying that for 20 years, so, so, so I would love, love to be young enough to have the feeling that of course it'll happen soon, but I've watched it not happen for so long, and I've watched the Republican Party harden against climate so firmly that we'll see. It may take uh, those of us in the area speculate from time to time that it's going to take something like an ozone hole. You recall, well, you may not recall, what led to the Montreal Protocol wasn't all the brilliant chemical work done, uh, a lot of it here at MIT that won a Nobel Prize. It was the opening of the ozone hole over the Antarctic. Like such an image. There's a hole in the ozone? Most of us didn't know there was ozone to have a hole in, but there's a hole in the ozone and it's letting in all these harmful rays and it's getting bigger. That was pretty dramatic. Uh, having the Arctic be ice free, maybe, maybe that'll be dramatic, but you know, we don't see that. Ozone hole, you go out and you get a suntan and your risk of skin cancer goes up. Well, that's, that kind of comes home. There aren't any more polar bears. Well, that's too bad, but I can go to the zoo. So I don't know what on the climate side, I, I, I love polar bears, don't, don't, please don't quote me. Uh, they're charismatic megafauna, as the phrase goes. Um, I, I, it may well take something like that. Anyway, anything else before I go to the, to the policy arena? Yeah. Are the big bears um, large companies or small uh, In terms of uh, this industry? The, the, the big companies have bought small companies to get the technology. So the people who were big gas producers are big gas producers. Again, there are still small players. There are still small players. I don't know. I don't have the sense. Um, I could be wrong, but I, I don't have the... And we do sort of see these folks when they come to the energy initiative to, to fund research. So we get some sense of what at least some of them are interested in. I hear a lot more interest in uh, finding technologies than extraction technologies. Uh, 3D se seismic um, underground mapping, um, improvements there rather than better drilling. Uh, this has, it's a young technology, but it seems surprisingly mature. Nobody says, if only we could do this. The, the one issue that people talk about, and the Times mentions it a little bit, is the technology was aimed at gas. Uh, and it's not yet tuned for oil. And there are places where there's oil. But they're getting a ton of oil out of North Dakota, so it's not too badly tuned. So uh, this doesn't seem to be, this particular technology doesn't seem to be a huge R&D target. At least that's my sense. The stuff that would help you... Yeah, that's very deep shale. The stuff that would help you f figure out where the gas is uh, seems to be higher on their wish list than techniques to get it out. If they can find it, they can go down 10,000 feet, drill sideways, break the shale, and get the gas out, which is pretty amazing. But, okay. 
the policy arena. So uh, the, the Penn Environment Report is pretty good on this. Uh, it's, it's a bit of an advocacy piece, but it's pretty good. You would normally think that the air stuff would be EPA, the air pollution issues I talked about. There's a Safe Drinking Water Act that you would think would cover stuff that would affect the aquifer, and indeed it does in a lot of, a lot of areas. But there are exemptions to a lot of federal legislation put in place quietly in the middle of the night that means there's relatively little EPA can do. It can set some standards for local air emissions, and it's doing that for methane emissions. It will probably have regs on methane leakage. But the water side, it's pretty limited by law. I mean, it covers a lot of stuff that pollutes aquifers. It can't get at this. Now, and even if it set the standards, the enforcement would be at the state level. And if you think about it, this is not easy enforcement. I showed you 2,400 wells in Pennsylvania, lots more coming. How many inspectors do you think the state of Pennsylvania has to, d to inspect natural gas wells? Well, they haven't had any natural gas drilling in Pennsylvania or drilling for anything in Pennsylvania. So they probably started out with, oh, let's say zero. And maybe they have a few if their budget's been generous. So enforcement's a state issue. The rules about the fluids are state issues. EPA can't control that. Rules for that well, the bore, how well it's sealed, how thick the concrete is, what kind of concrete, all of the stuff that gets you down below the aquifer and that has to be inspected, that's the state. The experience and attitudes vary enormously among states. New York, as I'll mention in more detail, has a moratorium. You cannot do this in the state of New York. Full stop, done. Pennsylvania is letting people drill. Does Pennsylvania have expertise? Does Pennsylvania have an adequate budget? Does Pennsylvania have adequate laws? The Penn Environment Report suggests not. Others may disagree. I don't know enough to have a view. Um, Texas, Texas does oil and gas. They've been drilling and fracking in Texas for a long time, not at this scale. And Texas also has a lot of rural areas where, yeah, it's a dusty and it's dirty and it's, I don't care, nobody lives here. It's a job, they're jobs, that's fabulous. Um, some states are revving up. There's a lot of industry interest. There's a lot of, uh, Texas is now requiring fluid disclosure. I think others are. There's an interesting industry split. The small guys oppose regulation. The small guys say, I don't want to tell you what my fluid is. I don't want to be inspected. I'm doing a good job. Leave me alone. I'm just a little guy. You talk to people from Exxon, and people from Exxon and Chevron and those guys say, we need regulation. Okay, this is anti-stereotype, and it's worth thinking about because we'll come to public policy in a little while. They want regulation. Why do they want regulation? They don't want to see a lot of those videos of drinking water burning. They don't want a lot of states to do what New York has done and say, you can't drill here. So the big guys think, okay, it adds a dollar or two per million cubic feet to control methane emissions, to inspect the well bore, to limit the fracking fluids, to disclose everything. A dollar is nothing to the big guys. A dollar might be something to the little guys. The big guys are afraid of a backlash. The big guys are afraid, and you hear them say this over, uh, after about two drinks, this industry could go to the way of nuclear power. The public could be so fed up with earthquakes and groundwater pollution and burning water coming out of faucets that we get shut down. And the country that could have all this abundant, relatively clean energy won't get it. So the big guys are in favor of 
sensible regulation. There's a lot of industry best practice activity. There's a lot of work by the big guys with the states to avoid a backlash. Please impose reasonable costs on this industry. We will still be cheap. Don't shut it down. An awful lot in the environment community think state regulation can't work. Pennsylvania is going to regulate natural gas drilling. They haven't seen a well for 100 years. What? So they say it's hard to enforce. You're going to inspect every well as it's being drilled. You're going to monitor the quality of the concrete. This is a serious enforcement problem. They're all over the landscape. You can't do it. Yes, in principle, regulation might make this safe and, if, and, and so forth and clean, but you can't do it, so you should just kill it. Just kill it. You, again, if you, if you Google fracking on, uh, if you do look at Google Images uh, uh, and, and, and call for fracking, you will get posters and rallies galore. Ban it, ban it, ban it. Stop fracking in Ohio. Where else did, do you see a lot of it? It's banned in New York. It's banned in France. It's banned in at least one German state. And there are debates in lots of other places that say basically you can't make It's a moratorium. If you can prove it's clean and safe, we'll let it go on. In North Dakota, it's jobs. In Texas, it's we know this and nobody lives out there on those ranches anyway. In New York, it's, it, this is New York. People live here. Pennsylvania, people live here. Yeah, Jessica. How long could you go using the natural gas reserve? The, the ones we have now, the shale gas? Hard to know. We don't, what we're getting are estimates of probably recoverable reserves. Proved reserves are much lower, but estimates are hundreds of years. It's just a lot of gas at, at, at low costs. So the, what that thought leads to, and the fact that it's cheap, leads to it may be impossible to kill. Because the economic benefits are so large that politically it may be hard to kill. But suppose everybody in Pennsylvania has their water uh, their water burn when it comes out of the tap. Will New York drop its moratorium? Probably not. Will Ohio impose a moratorium? Probably. So if you can't make it safe, you know, what's a little burning water? I mean, it's things, but anyway, um, think about the stuff we breathe every day. Um, but that's dramatic. That's a YouTube video. Um, the Penn Environment Report has sort of a balanced proposal. It talks about, this is another part of the environment commu environmental community, it clearly couldn't be killed in Pennsylvania, right? There's 3,000 producing wells and 10 a day being permitted. What, are you kidding? We're going to kill this? I don't think so. Not now. So they say what you need to do is eliminate these federal exemptions so EPA can play a role for groundwater. And they have a number of very specific suggestions, which I don't want to go in for tightening regulation in Pennsylvania, like not letting this stuff happen near a school or near a hospital, just because there is increased local pollution no matter what you do. Uh, and giving the agency some money to enforce. It's easy to write rules. Enforcement takes people. Um, and then finally, that lovely interview with Fred Krupp. Fred Krupp from the Environmental Defense Fund, as we'll talk about later, the Environmental Defense Fund has played a very interesting role historically in, in making environmental policy in this country, to the extent possible, economically sensible. Um, and Krupp argues you can't do anything in Washington. So to say the EPA should play a role, of course it should. But you can't get that passed. You can't get sensible legislation passed in Washington. You can't get those loopholes closed, at least not now. And you probably shouldn't kill it because the benefits are so large. 
I think underlying that is a realist saying you probably can't kill it because the economic benefits are so large for so many people. So there really isn't any choice but to work, for the, work with the states. Encourage the states to talk to each other, encourage the big producers to work with industry. So that's sort of the policy environment, I think. Reactions, comments, anything? Okay, let me throw the floor open. Suppose we were lucky enough or unfortunate enough to have shale in Massachusetts. You're MIT students, you can march on the state house. You can get TV time. You can, you can make noise. What do you do? Drill, baby, drill. We need the jobs, we need the benefits. Let's, let's be real, let's make it hard. It's not under Boston, okay? That would be too easy. They're never gonna drill under Paris. But suppose the shale is in the western part of the state, which has been chronically depressed. Suppose that's where the shale is. The western part, of the, not the Berkshires, kind of central Massachusetts, Pittsfield. Has anybody, anybody been to Pittsfield? Okay. <laughs> You've been to Pittsfield. All right. Are you from Pittsfield? No, it's near Tanglewood. It is near Tanglewood. Tanglewood is nice. Pittsfield, well, Mass Mocha, but otherwise, been depressed for a long time. We got shale in Pittsfield in the central part of Massachusetts where there are no jobs, and you're going to march on the state house. Alex, you had a, was that your hand I saw? Yeah, I was, was going to say, like, I think if there is a way to do it safely, like if they can figure out how to do it so that your faucet isn't burning, then I think it would be a thing that you should do. But otherwise, like, I don't think it's worth it if you're causing all the problems to, like, all the people who live there. Because there are a lot of people in Massachusetts. Even in Pittsfield. So would you advocate a moratorium until we know for sure how to do it safely? Are we sure we know how to regulate? No. No? <laughs> okay, but you would say, at the very least, the state ought to acquire some expertise. We ought to have a legal framework. I mean, nobody's drilled for anything but water in Massachusetts ever. So we, we don't have anybody who knows about, about deep wells or groundwater contamination. Well, we know about groundwater contamination. Okay. Anybody else? Ariana? Large-scale benefits um, in the end, like, and you know, it's like great to do it in taxes in places where people don't really live. But there is a large sentiment of like, not in my backyard. Um, and you know, like we like our house, and we, I, I'm um, like primary residence in New York City. I'm like the whole point of going there is that it's like nicer and clean. The air is clean, um, and like getting to like spend some time like with nature, I guess. Um, <laughs> and, I hope like, you have some nature up there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like the the idea is like great if uh, energy prices fall, but I don't want it at my expense. So you you'd advocate if we can translate to Western Massachusetts, which isn't that dissimilar, you'd say no, no, thank you. They're doing it in Texas. They're doing it in North Dakota. The people in Pennsylvania may or may not have made a mistake, but we're we're not going to do it. Full stop. Okay. Uh, I would also say, like, why would the, why would, if you're Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, or whoever has a significant population and has no experience with it, why be in a hurry to, like, go ahead and, uh, and drill everything and not just wait to see, like, some sort of regulations? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, to have a, a clear framework of what you should regulate and how you should do it and what are the, what are the consequences and all that. So leave, like, North Dakota and Texas have, like, uh, a smaller, uh, lower population density, figure out like the hard stuff, and then figure out if you want to do it or not in a few years when you know what the consequences are. Of course, we may not be happy with a regime that would make them in happy in North Dakota, right? Because they're desperate for jobs and we're not that desperate. So they might be willing to deal with, in, to, to accept environmental harms that we wouldn't like. So you wouldn't just want to follow them necessarily. Julian? Um, so 
I, I'm going to agree with Alex for the most part in that regulation is needed to some extent. Well, it is needed to keep things safe. Um, but realistically, you're going to have to work very, very, very hard to keep people's hands off of money sitting under the ground. Um, like, I'm from Santa Barbara, and like... You can, you can see the oil out there, can oh, you? Yeah. yeah. I can see like 13 oil rigs from my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like... There is a very, very, very strong environmental movement. Like, it's California, like, blue Democrat is as hard as you can go, pretty much. You but do have some Republicans in Santa Barbara. We, we do, but, but <laughs> it is quite blue. Yeah, yeah. It is quite, quite blue. And still, people drill for oil. You can see the, the oil rigs out there. They, they're even pumps on land and whatnot. And, I mean, it's kind of a tough argument to go against it economically. I mean, when you can say that, okay, these people might have some bad health effects from fracking and whatnot, but if they can't afford health care anyway, then, <laughs> 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 then what's the difference, really? Uh, <laughs> well, we have universal health care in Massachusetts to a pretty good approximation, so we're okay here. <laughs> So, you, so we may as well just drill because everybody can get health care? Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's an example. Like, if someone can't afford something, like, the economic benefits, I mean, not necessarily in Massachusetts exclusively, but let's say another state which doesn't have universal health care. Let's say. Um, that argument could be... Connecticut or Rhode, Western Connecticut, Rhode Island, yeah. I mean, the, there are economic benefits which can in turn have other benefits. Uh, and yes, there d should definitely be regulation, but the argument to, to say, no, we should absolutely not touch the stuff that's under the ground, is going to be extremely, extremely hard, especially when you go against probably all the lobbyists from X different firms which are for this. And all the mayors of depressed towns who say, we need jobs, we need jobs. Oh, but now you're going to, you're, you're going to agree or disagree? Uh, I disagree, actually, because like, when we had that line of negotiations, we were talking about how urgent it is to start taking actions to reduce the CO2 emissions, and other greenhouse uh, house gas emissions. So if we start getting gas using this method, and many studies show that it, has, it might have very bad effects on the environment, and in 10 years, we will see, okay, what are the bad effects that this method has. It's going to be like 2022, and then we get going to start discussing again how to reduce greenhouse emissions. I think it's going to be too late by then, and at this time, we so don't you'd have say no. Yeah. I mean, we don't have room for, for any, any more mistakes again. Or let them make the mistakes in North Dakota and not, not, na and not nationwide. Is anybody, nobody in here is from North Dakota, as I recall. I, I can insult North Dakota. Oh, get out of town. Uh, David. I think, like, from an environmental uh, perspective, even if you can drill and it's, like, 100% clean and no methane is leaking and your water is not fire, this is still a terrible thing for carbon emissions because, like, your options for decreasing your heating bill are, like, insulating your house so it's more efficient and so you don't need as much heat, or using cheap natural gas so that you can continue having a really so you you you're troubled by the bridge to nowhere argument, and you'd say unless we actually can fit this into a climate policy, which it could be if it were part of a carbon tax, use this for a while, get off it. Would you be comfortable with that, or you just you just say no? So I say like environmentally, that's yeah. Or you could use you know if the costs are so low, you can have a very high carbon tax, and then use that revenue to perhaps support solar or nuclear or whatever. But I think economically, like. You can't make that argument. You have to give people jobs and you know, like environmental <laughs> arguments are going to get legislation passed. So you're saying you'd march on the state house and you'd say only with a carbon tax, and you'd count on losing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, hey, you fight the good fight. Jobs are not going yeah. to be are going to be the environment every time. Yeah. Max, you've been patient. Yeah. Um, so I would say that.
So you think no matter what we, what we say in here and what you guys do when you march on the Capitol, we're going to drill. But, but New York didn't. Maybe because of all those signs in Ariana's town. Maybe Ariana's town shut down New York. New York, and there are a lot of people in upstate New York who need jobs. There are a lot of depressed towns up there. There are a lot of landowners up there who'd love to lease for drilling. But they managed to shut it down. We're going to talk about that. But, uh, you want to go on? <laughs> yeah. Well, my, my, my guess is there are people from some South Dakota towns who are now living in North Dakota. Uh, yeah. North Dakota was going to change the name of its state to Dakota to avoid the North for a while. But uh, I just think that economic benefit is too big to pass up. And if there's like a serious environmental concern, it'll become more apparent. It'll be accelerated to regulation if we allow it to happen more here. So you think it's going to happen? We're going to see environmental concerns. Uh, the, the, what the big guys are worried about is weak regulation leads to environmental disasters, leads to a nationwide moratorium. Whatever happened in New York could happen nationwide, maybe, maybe not in North Dakota. But that's their concern. And you're saying we should, we should run that. Yeah, I mean, I think if they realize the economic benefit from the beginning, they're not going to stop it immediately. Like, all together, they're going to like, provide some regulation. Well, there's a lot of work doing regulation. Again, it varies state to state, but okay, yeah? Um, I think you know, there's a two-part argument for doing it, but doing it on a, on a limited scale. You know, the first is that, uh, like we said, there's kind of an uh, oversupply of gas at the moment, you know, and the uh, technology being relatively new is relatively expensive, so you're buying high and selling low. Uh, but it is important to start getting some kind of an understanding of the drilling process, because from what I understand, um, the effects are different from place to place because you know what's in the shales is, is different. So what works and what's on the way down in the Dakotas differs. is different from what maybe works in Massachusetts. Because it's different you know, composition. So I would argue for doing a, a limited rollout. You know, like ah. you don't do it five miles from the town. You do it forty miles from the town, and you don't authorize three thousand wells. You authorize, you authorize thirty. You know, and see what happens. And hopefully. So that's interesting. So you'd, uh, and I hadn't heard that proposal before, so, which is what makes it interesting. So you'd say, we're Massachusetts, we haven't done this before, we're going to hire some people with expertise, but, you know, the ones in Texas who know what they're doing are mostly staying in Texas, so we can't effectively regulate 300 wells. Let's, let's authorize 30 and let's watch them closely and see what we can learn. Yeah, and, and once the market stabilizes, then you can start pumping more, and then you'll have a nice boom, hopefully using cheaper technology that's more developed at a higher price. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I hadn't heard that. OK. Marie, you had a? Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that, like, I think there has been like, some successful regulations. Um, I think the president went in Texas was kind of big inclusive for a long time, and a lot of regulation around this area. The Barnett Shale is actually like right over the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, so like it is really like in an urban location, and they are drilling like all around that, and um, it's just like a place where it has been well regulated. And I think it's like follow their example. Yeah, I mean Texas, for instance. Uh, in the bipartisan policy center thing seems to have been the first state to basically require disclosure of fracking fluids, which is sort of a first natural step, I think, and then you limit things that can go down. So maybe we can copy Texas, but they have been drilling in the Barnett for a while with, di with different technologies. So. Okay. And we should, we'll all wear hats. That'll be great. Sam? Um, well, kind of what, I just, as like someone from Massachusetts, I think, you know, if you're trying to like sell that proposal, you might have a hard time selling your Massachusetts to Massachusettsians, like copying Texas, just from like old associations like people in Massachusetts and other huge fan of Texas. I think like you didn't like Rick Perry's camp. Well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just think kind of politically, it'd be hard to sell. When it, just because massive people are like pretty environmentally cautious, and all really, I think all it would take is like one anecdote of like, oh, my cousin in Ohio, he had an earthquake, or his water was on fire. 
So we you think. We like to overreact. So, <laughs> political system overreacts. So your view is, um, even though Ariana's community managed to shut down the state of New York, which is a pretty blue state, but probably less environmentally conscious than this one, it would be tough to do here. So what would you advocate instead? When you, mar when you march on the state capitol. Take the money and invest in like, green technology instead. And I think the path, like the, uh, this, this, like, path to nowhere argument is pretty good as well. It's pretty interesting, yeah. What, what about the uh, go slow approach? I think once you start down there, it's going to be hard to stop. Pretty slow. I mean, once you start putting in a few, I mean, it is going to produce cheap energy. <laughs> Really and jobs it. and jobs. We'll put them. We'll put them in Pittsfield or someplace like Pittsfield. Yeah, Max. Um, I think the biggest issue to gain the votes uh, is well, more from our record papers, there's just a lack of transparency in the industry. Uh, the argument that uh, the chemicals are proprietary, so we can't know, and then nobody really has a good way of measuring how much methane is actually released into the environment. And so we know the economic benefits of it, but we don't know the environmental detriment of it. So, and that's the biggest problem with regulating, even if you did like a few small wells before you moved into a large scale, you'd have trouble regulating them just because of those loopholes and the fact that there's no real metric for how much damage it's actually doing. There are techniques, not great techniques, but there are techniques that can measure methane emissions, methane leakage. It isn't trivial. That piece in Nature talked about how they managed to me measure methane emissions from sort of one area, um, methane leakage. But it's naturally tricky because it comes from lots of different places and is dispersed. You can, however, talk about sealing requirements and how joints are done. You can put in things. It, 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 it may be hard to measure what happens, but you can put in place regulation that will reduce it whether it'll reduce it enough, blah, blah, blah. So you're saying, so where would you go when you march? To, I mean, advocate for it because the economic benefits are there, but demanding transparency from the firms that are doing it, the kind of are putting to the ground and having them public or at least come up with some sort of metric to uh, let us know how much damage they're actually doing. Yeah, so you might, you might work on the development of measurement methods for methane, for instance, and require them to implement them, and so on and so forth, yeah. Given how afraid some of the companies are of backlash, especially if you invite the bigger ones, perhaps it isn't as a slippery slope as you think. You know, as in if you build 30 and, you know, they do well and regulation starts loosening, that's almost immediately, you know, if anything does go wrong, that's the whole thing gets shut down. The companies are quite incentivized in a similar way to nuclear companies to keep, you know, a completely white sheet. The big guys are. So the little guys are the, are the potential trouble spots. And so for your 30, uh, given that you have some data on these big guys in other states, it would make sense for your 30 test cases and many of your future cases to be from those people that you have at least some prior history of. Oh, that's interesting. So you'd look at, you'd look at their regulatory history elsewhere, mm -hmm. and you would try in Massachusetts not to let people who have bad records drill. And then you have a comparative history between what they do in Massachusetts versus North Dakota and Yeah. Oh, just from an environmental perspective, isn't it better to do in Massachusetts in the, in the sense that it's going to be happening the world over? So you could argue that it happens in Massachusetts and the type of population that you have and all these engineers, you're going to set industry best practices in Massachusetts which are going to be copied in North Dakota then. Maybe. Maybe. The counter-argument is that because of our population density, uh, the, per, the uh, potential for damage is higher, potential for environmental damage. Yeah, yeah, no, no. So you're, you're saying you'd do it here, but you would allocate state resources, and of course you'd beg for federal resources, to improve best practices, to improve measurement methods. One of the things that the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board the CAB report that's cited in a couple of places stressed, they said, the government is lousy at this. The big guys in the industry are able to develop and improve best practices. They need to be encouraged to do it. The problem is, once you come up with a best practice, it becomes a compulsory practice and so forth. But, but that's a, another issue. Okay, I think we're out of time. Um, have a great long weekend. We will do electricity next week.